Okay, good morning, everybody. I can see there's still people joining us, um, but I wanted to welcome you to this morning's webinar, which is capturing staged performance for the screen. And the webinar is brought to you by The Space. Um, if you uh, don't know anything about The Space or aren't, aren't very familiar with us, here's a slide just to give you a flavour for what we do. So the UK's Digital Commissioning and Development Agency for the Arts and Cultural Sector. Um, um, we've commissioned more than 300 digital projects over the years, and that includes captures of performance. And what we do with the webinars, and particularly today, is use case studies from our experience to kind of really dig into some of the sort of practical and creative details of how you might work digitally. And um, today's webinar is really, as I said, there's, there's two case studies that we're using. So I'll show you the timetable now. This is what we'll be covering in the session. And e each of the case studies is looking at the kind of the practical element, elements of how you create a piece for a screen audience. So we're thinking about that, the sort of the, the creative, the practical processes. What we're not doing today is thinking too much about rights, any of the questions around rights or distribution, you know, how you find an audience for the work. It's more about the relationship between the theatre and the broadcast or screen production sides. Um, and what's really key to success. And also thinking about teams, the people involved, what skills are required and how we might build the screen skills within the sector. I hope you really enjoy the session. I'm really, really looking forward to both of these case studies this morning. But before we go into those, um, we're going to start with an intro from uh, Natalie Woolman, who's our development producer at The Space. So Natalie, are you, are you ready to say hello and welcome everybody and set up really why we think this is important? Indeed, thanks Linda. Hi everyone, I'm Natalie Woolman, development producer at The Space, where I also look after our slate of long form filmed productions. And to state the obvious, the past 18 months has been transformational for artists and audiences and how they connect online. COVID has pushed many performing arts organisations to try capturing their work, many for the first time. And now, even though we are tentatively back to live performance, plenty of organisations have plans to continue to capture at least some of their work. And I think that's because we've seen the value of capturing a production which can make work more accessible, more inclusive and more international. So why are we here today? Since COVID struck, the space has supported a lot of performing arts companies to capture their work. And that's been through our own commissioning rounds, through mentoring, through advice, and through events like this. And we have seen incredible adaptability and innovation from the sector. Technical directors turning their hands to multi-camera directing, classical music librarians becoming script supervisors, and whole teams throwing themselves into making this new hybrid form because performance capture is an emerging art form and the rules of it are still being written. Our thinking behind events like this is that hearing and sharing real life experiences, good, bad and ugly, can be really helpful for others embarking on their own projects. So please do ask questions of our speakers and share your own experiences of capture productions in the chat. It's also why today's session has been organised around two case studies. Birmingham Rep's Park Bench Plays, a series of micro plays that were originally commissioned as two handers for the Rep main stage, which were reimagined as short film shot on location for Sky Arts, which will be broadcast soon. And Touching the Void from Bristol Old Vic, a full length production of the theatre's epic adaptation of Joe Simpson's memoir. The film was streamed live around the world, made available on demand, and then distributed for broadcast on Sky Arts. We feel that they are an interesting duo because they took different approaches. Park Bench Plays were shot on location around Birmingham, a series of tightly scripted and shot films that celebrate their home city. By contrast, Touching the Void opens with a shot of the live audience at Bristol Old Vic and really celebrates the very theatricality of that production, its ingenious staging and its live audience. So I guess that's a first choice or provocation for any team looking to embark on a production capture. 
Do you want your audience to have an experience that is more cinematic and filmic or one that feels more theatrical in nature? The teams today will be able to tell us how they made their creative decisions. Then there's the question of who does what. In today's examples, the teams at both theatres took on key roles within the multi-camera teams and used their skills and knowledge of the production to create the final films. In both cases, they were supported by a mentor to upskill and both those mentors are with us today and speaking. Dan Alexander, who worked with the Birmingham Rep team and Rodri Hugh, who advised Bristol Old Vic. Before we go on, I think it's really important that I say that we realise capture projects are daunting. We know that not everyone has the same resources and it's not cheap to film a performance, even though those costs are coming down. We know that not everyone has access to a mental or filming expert. And we know that time and capacity across the sector is really tight, especially now that we've returned to in-person shows. And we're also aware there's a skills shortage across both theatre technical teams and multi-camera crews. But having said all that, we hope that today will allow you to hear and discuss some of the key principles of successful capture projects to help you think through your own. Because, and I'm sure all speakers today will agree, it's important to remember how many skills and how much expertise you already have within your organisation before embarking on a capture project. No one knows or loves the show better than the team which has developed, produced and staged it. The elements of sound, lighting, pacing, comic timing, music, these are all crucial elements both on stage and on screen and using your creative team's expertise in these areas to shape the final captured film will be crucial to its success. And your team already have strong views on what works on screen from lifetimes of watching TV, film and digital content, using these reference points to discuss within your team what works and what you want to achieve with your capture can be really beneficial. And I would say, please do steal the best ideas for your own capture projects. So I'm going to be quiet now. But I just wanted to welcome everyone on behalf of the space. I'm really looking forward to today's session and hopefully a good exchange of ideas in the chat. Thanks. Thanks, Natalie. So before we go into um, our first case study, I'm just checking that people can hear. And it, uh, we've, we've been talking about using the chat and I wonder if, for people in our audience, if you could just say a hello or a thumbs up or something so we can just make sure everything's working. Yes, smashing. We've got loads of hellos. Brilliant. Just checking we're OK. Um, and the other thing to note, as is in the is in the chat, we are recording the session so you can watch it again afterwards or share it as you want to. And um, we've also got, again, mentioned uh, We've got Claire, our captioner with us, so if, if live captions would be helpful to you, you just need to go to the bottom of the screen to pick all of those. Smashing, right, we're away, everybody's happy. So our first case study, as, as Natalie has set up so beautifully, is um, uh, the Birmingham Reps Park Bench Plays, and our two speakers who will introduce themselves and tell you a bit more about their role in it are going to join me now. So that's Leanne Tatum and Dan Alexander. So we will appear. Hello, hello, Leanne, and hello, Dan. Um, so, and I'm going to start with you, Dan, and ask you if you would just give us a bit of a, a flavour of Park Bench Plays. Okay, so I was hoping he was going to hand it over to Leanne, but no, it's okay, throw me in a deep end, that's fine. Um, so, like Nat Natalie mentioned, they were two-handers that were originally designed for the stage. So, um, the po at the po I think the point when I came in, um, the writing was being finalised, so it was a case of um, it being commissioned out and, you know, we had a variety of different writers that came in and created these really cool, interesting stories that were very much based on Birmingham and being set within Birmingham's history or some form of connection to the city um, from an artistic point as well. So it was a really kind of exciting opportunity to, you know, take something that was supposed to happen on a stage and transition that into um, a live performance and very much focus on the place that I grew up, which was Birmingham. So the plays are very much um, a, a kind of reenactment of really trying to bring the city to life in a way that for me, um, at least was quite unique in the way that it was actually done. 
especially being um, set in one location, which was is always a challenge when making a film, just having um, one location where you're trying to tell an entire story, not to mention that we're going to repeat that like six or seven times um, and try and keep that kind of engagement and that interest level up as well. Um, but yeah, that was part bench plays in, in a nutshell, to be fair. Brilliant. So we'll, we'll come back to the whole, the, the, the being on location, which is really interesting, isn't it, for a theatrical performance. But can you just tell us a bit about your, how you got involved and what your role is, because you kind of had two roles in this. Yeah, so um, I think initially my main involvement was supposed to be the mentor director, in a sense of helping the skill um, base from theatre transition over into the world of TV a little bit more smoothly. Um, I also ended up directing um, one of the plays as well. So mentor director and just a, an official um, director as well. So that was my main two key roles. Um, I was brought on at, I don't, it wasn't the start of the project. So I think it was quite well into the pre-production in regards to the stories are, are just being finalized. And we're now looking at physically taking something that is working conceptually on stage. And now we need to make sure that it can work um, outdoors in, in the great world of Birmingham um, so at that point that's when um, I really kind of you know managed to get my, my teeth sunk into the project and just do what I do as a director and hopefully make that whole process um, a little bit smoother. So as, a, as the kind of mentor director what was your what, who were you working with and what were you what were you, what were you working around what were you doing with them? Yes yeah, so, because I mean it is, it's, it's one of those titles that can change from project to project. So in this um, circumstance, my role as a mentor director was essentially to help those directors um, within the rep take what they do amazingly well on stage and making sure that those same principles can work or at least find a way to change so they work on screen as well. Because there are so many similarities, but there are so many differences as well. And my role was very much a case of saying, okay, so here's a problem that we've got. This would work on stage, but when we're trying to transition this for TV, this isn't gonna work, or this may take a little bit longer, or we may, we, we may not be able to get the same effect that you would have got on stage. So my role was kind of um, essentially problem solving in the sense of saying, okay, so how, how can we make sure that this impact happens, but in a way that's gonna work on TV? So I was very much working closely with the producers, um, with the directors from the rep and all the creative elements, literally from the, from the bottom all the way to the top in regards to making those part bench plays work and just making sure that at every single turn, um, I could offer the expertise that I've got in TV and making sure that everything that's happening from the rep side of things, from the theater side of things is basically gonna work and transition well once it gets to TV. Brilliant. Um, and so I'm going to come back to you in a minute and get you to give us some really sort of specific examples of what that means for you and what where, where were the where were the similarities, where were the differences, all of that. But um, in the meantime, we'll bring Leanne in. So uh, Leanne, hello, hello. So you were the production manager. Can you tell us a bit about that role and how you know it, to a, to a theatre audience, which most of our audience is today from theatre. What does what does the production manager do and how did it fit into this particular um, production? Um, well, it, um, it's usually brought down to the, the, the purse strings. <laughs> um, the the purse, purse strings, thing. they hold the purse strings. Um, so we, it was obviously, it was, it was a set budget that we had um, for crew, for locations, for post-production and things like that. So I was brought in a similar stage, I think, to Danny. So a lot of the plays, you know, it was already in the pipeline. So my role as well was to look after the scheduling, the crewing, making sure we'd got the right crew on location, the quite right kit, helping to find the locations. Um, so taking Danny and the uh, theatre directors on a nice little jolly around Birmingham, looking at parks, which was quite a nice afternoon. <laughs> um, so looking after that and then kind of pushing the post-production process through as well. Um, so, and other paperwork aspects, schedules, making sure everyone's got schedules and, and where to sort of, um, so everyone knows where they need to be, when they need to be there, planning, helping to plan the filming days. So, so basically trying to sort of keep everything ticking along smoothly on budget, on time um, and on point. Thank you. Um, when I spoke to you before, you said to me you'd never done a theatre production. So it was, a, you know, you, you come from a television world. And so what was, 
what was new to you? What, what felt familiar and what, what was new to you? I'm trying to sort of work out what, what are the differences between the two processes? Um, I mean, I thought it would be quite different, I have to be honest. I mean, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I love these plays. They, uh, yeah, it's been such a good experience. And I think I was really excited about working with the rep. It's such an iconic place in Birmingham and probably nationally, I, I hope. Um, and I just, I was so excited. And I think what I sort of was able to bring because of been working in television and working on location, it actually came quite naturally to me to help and sort that out. I'm used to taking crew out and bringing crew on board. And because the directing and the creative process was all in hand with, with Danny and the directors, I could really focus on I've got a great location for you and let's look at this place and we could have benches here. And like one of the biggest challenges was it was a play, it was plays about park benches and we didn't have a park bench. So then I'm sourcing park benches and phoning parks. Can we borrow a bench? <laughs> Um, so it was it was it was quite good. It was quite good to see how all my varied experience actually was helpful. And I think what you sometimes forget when you work with lots of people who are used to film, it's the post-production process that lots of people, and no disrespect, I don't mean it to sound patronizing, but don't understand the post-production. And why would you? It's quite complex. It takes quite a long time, it's quite involved. There's a number of people that need to be involved in the post-production process. And I think what I really enjoyed was being able to share that knowledge and, and what could have seemed to be probably quite daunting for theatre productions because it's like live television, isn't it? Once you've done, you know, once everything's in place for a theatre production, I suppose everybody feels quite relaxed and then it's about the performance. And once that live performance is over, it's on to the next day. Whereas obviously when you're doing it for TV, it's a lot longer and there's loads of different stages. And I really enjoyed being able to share my experience and put people's minds at rest that no, it's going to be okay. This is how long it normally takes. This is this is going to plan. And um yeah, so I yeah, I, I it was it was a great experience. I loved it. Yeah. And, and I'm sort of, I'm listening to you both speaking, saying, you know, I'm imagining you've already got a bit, there's a whole theatre team involved already. And then we've got a production manager, we've got a mentor, director, there's a lot of people involved. And, you know, your role in this from both of you is thinking about that, an audience who are going to watch this on a screen rather than live. Um, and, and as, you know, and it's still, there's a play, a quality of it still being a play. How, what were the challenges for you? What were, what were the really interesting? I'm sort of trying to get you to be really specific about some of the interesting ways that the performance came together. So, Dan, I wonder if I could start with you. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, that was probably the, the biggest challenge that we had anyway, which was um, from the offset, the team, the rep team were very, very keen on trying to make sure that the stage plays still looked and felt like stage plays. Um, even though they're going to be transitioned for TV. So it was about trying to find that that middle ground and that language of saying, okay, that, that makes sense um, visually. Like I understand exactly what you're saying, but now we need to remember that the audience is going to be um, slightly different and the medium's different as well. So a specific example um, was that it was the very initial conversations based around all of the plays that were going to be filmed. Um, they were initially going to be done as one complete take in the sense of we press record at the beginning and then we stop 10 minutes later and it's recorded and it's performed just like it would do on stage where there are no cuts, there are no, um, you know, mess. if you mess up, we, you know, the idea was to start, start again from scratch. Um, so that's where a lot of my conversations came in where I was saying, I totally understand it, but um, I feel like we'd have a better and faster approach if we did it in a more traditional way for TV. Um, but at the same time though, find that middle ground where we're allowing the actors to work as if they are performing for stage where they are going to try and aim to do it as a one take um, and that will be the setup that's what we'll, we'll actually go through but the middle ground that we found was basically instead of um, doing a one take which was proposed to us and then instead of doing it the way that I would normally do it which would be let's do this angle stop let's do that angle stop let's pick up this shot over here and then we can pick up the end of the play a little bit later so instead of instead of 
us each doing it our own way. We literally created a new way of um, working, which worked for both parties, which was essentially, we'll try our best to run it as one take. However, we have to accept the fact of that's not gonna happen. And it's not necessarily comfortable for the actors as well, especially outside of the elements. And you've got the public as well that we're trying to deal with. Um, so specifically, it was very much a case of, okay, let's map out the different angles that we're, um, we need to get to basically make sure that it works for um, TV. And also at the same time, when uh, mistakes do happen, or if there is a fluff of a line, we're not gonna start again from scratch. We're gonna do what is more traditional in TV, where we start, we pause, we pick it up a line um, previously and just keep it going. And we found that that worked so much faster and quicker for the fact of we are working with cameras for TV. Whereas obviously on stage, it would be a lot quicker to just find a way to keep it moving because you don't have you don't have the luxury of going back and redoing things again um so it was about trying to make sure that everybody um that was from the theater background with theater disciplines understood that on the on the surface on paper it may look like that would actually take longer in production to you know okay we've got to keep stopping and starting and pushing things back but actually actually a lot quicker to actually get things done if we actually adopt um that principle so you're sort of trying to you're marrying along two processes, aren't you, and finding the best yeah. bits. Yeah, and it, and it worked. It worked. It was fun. Um, I think it helped the actors a lot. I think everybody else there from a production um, point of view as well understood that it, it was the best way to get things done. And, and it, it helped with a lot of challenges as well, because, again, we film 90 percent of making any sort of production is just problem solving. So when we've got issues with the public, when we've got issues with um, continuity in the background because somebody's on a swing now and it wasn't on a swing or there's a car there now and it wasn't a car because we have that freedom to, you know, do things a little bit um, more traditional towards TV. It allows us to kind of, you know, tackle those problems a lot more effectively. Thank you. And, and Leanne, what about you? What did you, how did you how did this work for you? All these different people and the different skills coming together. Um, I think it was great because it, it, we had um, because essentially the way it was set up was the rep would pull it together and produce it as they would if it was going on stage. And I mean, this is making it sound a lot simpler than it actually was. They produce it as a place. We just turn up with some cameras and film it. Um, so you know, and therefore we got to work with the the wardrobe the wardrobe lady. So who. It, it, it's just little things like that and the stage manager that that worked with us who's used to obviously stage managing and doing the props and things like that she was brilliant on location and she bought her stage managed skills and was almost like a first ad director that you'd have on like a drama like quite on set everybody cameras rolling so she she loved being able to to bring her experience and work with us and work beautifully with the the camera team um but I think what was quite good because we'd looked at how we could film this and it wasn't a huge budget for these. So we doubled up the plays and had one filming in the morning and one filming in the afternoon as much as we could. Um, but that was that was the plan. It obviously didn't work beautifully because there was weather and COVID, unfortunately, to deal with as well. Um, but it meant that because there was this plan of how it was going to be filmed and like Danny said, once it was all put in place it meant it was a lot quicker a lot a lot more efficient that we just had it had we were able to do two in one day and chose the locations that were literally it was almost like put a bench there the backdrop is completely different it's got the library of Birmingham in the back of shot then you put the camera you put the bench there it's literally like 20 meters away but now it's the canal and high rise um, flats and it looks quite in a city and it was you know, so there's little things like that, that you just, you can um, just make the day as efficient as possible and smooth running. But yeah, if that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to ask you um, about sort of the, the budget and you're saying, you know, it's not a huge budget, but as I said at the beginning, you know, for a lot of people on the call that any budget is, a, you know, is important. So, you know, if, if you were working on a sort of smaller scale, what the principles of what you were doing and what you're bringing to it what would be your advice to an organization that did had a very small budget what would what would be the things that you would suggest that people focus on and after you've answered that question I'll get I'm going to bring Natalie back in so Dan to you what you know if your budget was limited where would where would you concentrate your effort my, so my effort and again it's something that we actually did was really looking at time um, because we've we've 
TV and doing anything that involves cameras and crew, it is the most expensive thing in the world if you go over budget because you have to bring everybody back. It's not an issue of, oh, we'll just bring back one camera or we'll just bring back the sound department or we'll just bring back the wardrobe. Everything has to come back. So the effort goes into how can we maximize our days as much as possible? How can we factor in um, contingencies? How can we make sure that, again, just like Liam was talking about in regard to the locations, instead of moving from one area to another, let's just move the bench, <laughs> let's just turn it around. And because you know we do have the, the flexibility of, well, not the flexibility, I say the luxury of filming in one location, we don't have to change too many camera angles. So moving a bench 20 meters will look like we're in a completely different place. So for me, anything to do with a limited budget is always about time, make as much use out of the time that we have to get as much done as possible and make sure that any potential problems that could arise are thought about very, very early on. Yeah. Gosh, so you're sort of planning and planning and planning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Leanne, what you're nodding like mad. What do you what what's your take on that? Planning, 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 planning. <clears throat> Excuse me. For anything. Um, and and I think I think if in a in a, a in a theatre environment, you will have your theatre producers. And so all the elements that that they are used to pulling together and and, and are putting in place for a a live production on a stage, those skills are really easily transferable over into producing for a film, because essentially you are getting all your actors in place, all your props, um, costume, um, uh, wardrobe, sorry, makeup. Um, so all those elements that experienced theatre producers have can easily transfer into what you're doing for life. I think location, <coughs> excuse me, um, is obviously if you're going to stay in your theatre, you've got your location sorted, so that's not a problem. But but planning it meticulously with anything, because the way I often say to people, the way I think about it when I explain this to people, for whatever production you're doing, if your planning is is to like to within an inch of the production's life, so to speak, you know what you're going to produce, you know the film you're going to produce, you'll know exactly what you need to film to create your end result. And then that makes your filming more efficient because you only film what you really actually need rather than, well, we'll just get this for safety and we'll just get that in case we need it. And what about we might need that? But you don't have the time or the budget to do that. So everything has to be planned really, really carefully. And then that will also help you in post-production because you've almost got a paper edit of what you want to produce. And then when you get into the edit, you've got it on paper. So your edit is quicker and more efficient because that is also, um, you know, you need a cutoff point really for something like that. Because if you if you have an edit and you're like, oh, we don't know, you know, we, oh, let's, let's give it a week and see how we get on. You can't really do that. You have to be quite rigid because you have tweak and tweak and tweak and tweak and tweak with an edit. But if you've got all the planning in place, you've got efficient filming and then you've got an efficient edit, mm -hmm. efficient edit. And all that together will save time and money. Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, we're just we're noticing it just in, in the chat, people are talking about even for, for lots of organizations, even the idea of having a crew is a, a big expense. And I, I think we're you're speaking from your experience, aren't you? And and how you work. And that's we'll we'll really come back to that. I'll get you to think about, you know. If, if you had nothing, if you, if you were on a very, very small budget, what would you, how, how does that translate really? So we might, we might come back to that a bit towards the end thinking, how does it translate? What are the principles you could draw out of this? Okay, smashing. Thank you both very much. I'm going to get Natalie to just drop in. Natalie, did you have a, did you have a question that you wanted to put to, to Dan? Yeah, I've got a lot Thank of questions, you. but I'll try and limit, I'll, I'll limit them. But I've got one of the things which um, obviously we're talking about principles, depending on people's, budgets and what their production is but one of the things I would be really interested to know is um, as we've said the park bench plays are two handers set on or around a bench so they're quite um, there's quite a lot of sitting in them and one of the um, things that I'm really aware of that we've seen quite a lot of because of Covid restrictions but also because of budgets in the last year we've seen quite a lot of monologues and two handers being what people have been able to capture for a variety of reasons. And I'd just be interested to know, to, 
maybe from Danny creatively, how you inject a sense of how you use a camera, whether it's an iPhone or television broadcast cameras, how you inject a sort of sense of movement and pace into whether it's a monologue or a two hand or something that is in theory quite a static piece, how you kind of think through that. Yeah, so it's a really good question. And um, I think the point that you made about whether it's broadcast or whether it's on an iPhone is, is really to the point because it's literally the same principles, whether you're working on high end TV or whether you are just shooting with an iPhone and you're by yourself. It's about trying to find ways to make it um, less static, like throwing, throwing some movement in there, throwing, throwing ways to make sure that the audience are engaged. So um, for us, again, it was very much based in a plan and it was something that we really thought about and concentrated on before we even turned the camera on. It was a case of saying, if we're gonna have people looking at this conversation for 10 minutes, giving all the credit to the writers, all the credit in the world, it doesn't matter how good it is, you still wanna make sure that people are engaged. So we started looking at ways of, okay, how do we move the camera? So, you know, we, we had access to tracks. We um, decided to do things like um, slight pans and slight tilts, but, more so away from that because again you know not everybody's going to have access to tracks not everybody's going to have access to maybe even tripods that can do the movement to the level that is required sometimes it's just about the whole blocking of the movement so as opposed to sitting down the whole time maybe at different points of the conversation one of the people stand up and they walk to the back of the bench as if they're walking off they switch positions they shuffle in their seats um it's things where you know, in some of the plays, they're actually talking about an object that's present within the scene as well. So they get up and they walk over to the um, object, they come back. So it's just about finding creative ways that are motivated by the conversation to get those characters up and moving. So it takes less away from the technical aspects of having expensive things like cranes and tracks and stuff like that. And more so just looking at how can we kinetically convert a conversation into something that involves a movement that is motivated and actually adds to the story as well. Thanks. That's really clear, actually. Thank you, Dan. Um, and uh, Leanne, we've had questions. I don't even know if you can answer this about sort of audience in thinking about audience interaction and participation in 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 work that goes out on a digital platform. Have you ever been asked to think about that? How you'd create any of that, or some of the things that you'd have to do around that? I'm thinking as well as well as the, not on just on this case study, but also the work you've done with Ex-Cathedral, whether you thought about how the audience would enjoy it. Um, we, we've not really been asked um, to do much. Um, we have done things like that. We, we, we did, um, <laughs> this is completely different. We did a one hour live Zoom event for a beer brand and that was interactive. And it was on Halloween, not the Halloween just gone, a pre-lockdown Halloween when people were all still allowed to hang out together in an enclosed space. Um, and that was incredible, to be honest, because we'd set up like a studio in a in a in a council-run building that wasn't too expensive. Um, and it went out, we had audience there, but we also had audience at home who were logging in. I think the brand used their Facebook feed. And then we had people um, within the room. So it was a live vision mix, like it was showing my age, but a bit like, don't forget your toothbrush. So a bit daft and a little bit raucous because there's beer involved. Um, but a guy hosting it, giving out t-shirts to the people in the audience, people at home messaging in and they were hosting it. And then we were able to feed comments to the host who could then speak to Dave who had messaged in from Swansea um, to get involved and there's a beers coming to you I keep referring to beer I'm very conscious about that um but um so that's our kind of experience of doing that and it was great fun and that I mean again there was budget involved with that but hosting it the brand had their Facebook page already sorted um and it just it, it went out on their feed um so that's my, and I think we did something as well with um, when we, we, we live streamed something to Australia from Sadler's Wells, but we flipped it so that the dancers who had no audience had screens so that when the audience in Australia were clapping and cheering, they could hear the audience appreciation. It's really emotional and really simple. 
and then the audience could see the dancers reacting to their applause. Everyone was crying it was just, um, because it was locked down and the dancers hadn't performed for a live audience for so long. So I think, I don't know whether that's the right audience participation to use as an example, but that's my experience Thank so you. far. <laughs> And it's so we're sort of going a little bit away from the case study, but what you're saying no, is sorry. Well, no, it's great. It's great <laughs> because what, what I think that's really going to then tie us into our next case study, which is um, from it was recorded at Bristol Old Vic and from Bristol Old Vic, and that whole the two audiences that pays into that. Yeah, see, I, see, I knew that I was trying to seamlessly. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> so, thank you very much. We're going to um, so we're going to have a five minute break before we go into the next case study um, and there are heaps of other questions and comments in the chat and I wondered Dan and Leanne whether you wouldn't mind just going into the chat and if there's anything that you feel that you've got a, an answer to just write it in there in the break and over into the next case study if that's all right. So thank you very much for, for sharing all of that about Park Bench Plays with us. We'll take a, a five minute break now, and then we'll come back and hear from Rodri and Giles about touching the void. And then after that, we'll bring all our panelists back together. and We'll have a sort of really general discussion about some of the themes and ideas that are coming through. So see you at 11.41, thanks. Okay, so um, it was just a, a really quick break and we'll be hearing now about, as we said, we're looking at Touching the Void next from um, Bristol Old Vic and we're going to be joined by Rodri Hugh and Giles Chiplin to talk about that project. Uh, Rodri, I can see Giles oh, and you're here. Hello, hello. Really nice to see you. And um, Giles, so you're the, I'll start with you, you're the general manager at the Bristol Old Vic. Um, can you start by explaining a bit about um, about the project and your role in it? Yeah, sure. So uh, this role, general manager, is is fairly new to the organisation. 
Um, and essentially, it's kind of the linchpin between all of the departments um, that are necessary to facilitate not just a live stream, but then a distribution of that film. We have a producer who produces a stage show, and we're a theatre of principle. It is about the stage show. We then have another producer for the film, and essentially we have a separate team that sits on top of the team doing the show in order to deliver the film. And what I do is work between the two producers, but all of, also all of the other stakeholders involved in the project. So that could be the other co-producers, I suppose, um, vitally the distributors for Touching the Void. We had distributors on board who essentially had bought the film before we'd made it. So you've got certain timeframes that you have to work to. You have certain specifications that you have to film to. You have certain materials that you have to deliver. And it's making sure that everyone who, who has to deliver on that knows what they need to be doing. So it's, it's taking the information, it's feeding the information, um, and then bringing it back so that you do everything appropriately. Mm -mm. And so with Touching the Void, you decided that you wanted to have a live stream and then make it available on demand and also to think about future broadcast mm -hmm. of the piece. And I suppose there was two reasons for that one of which will be less relevant to you and one of which will be more. We're a theatre and we were in a lockdown and we were in social distancing and we're quite a small theatre anyway, we've about 550 seats. So if you can only sell half of them, the business doesn't really work. So we thought the only way we're going to be able to put a play on is if we also have a digital audience and if we share it that way. At the same time, we had already been exploring with sharing film work and principally that's work that had been filmed for archive capture and then re-edited and kind of packaged up and put behind a paywall and shared with the audience. And we were interested in that and we thought the next step would be to create a piece of work specifically for that reason. Um, and, and therefore, why did we choose Touching the Void? We knew it was a play that worked and what it did, I suppose, is it freed up all of the creatives that deliver a stage show from having to think too much about the stage show and to be able to think more about the film um, because you're trying to do two things at the same time and making a stage show is incredibly complicated and, and people should be able to focus on that but also everything essentially happened in a week so we got into the space and within a week we teched a show we did a show and we made a film and if we tried to do that with a brand new play, I think we'd have had to have not just a separate production team, but essentially a separate creative team. And we didn't. The director of the stage show, Tom Morris, was the director of the film. Um, and the same for a number of creatives. So, so being able to take a show that we knew worked and we knew really well um, was, was, was key. You know, e even um, before we did the, um, before we got into the space, we took a recording that had been done of the show, I think when it was in the West End, and everyone was able to sit down with the script, sit down with that recording, and use it to create the shop Bible, um, which, which was imperative. And if we, and, and I, I said to our production manager, I said, what would happen if we had to stream a show the week that it was created and we didn't have that resource how would we go about the planning he said we'd have to film a dress rehearsal uh, you know we cannot go into that that shop bible we'd, we'd have to have that resource um trying to do that at the same time as we launch a show i think would have been really really tricky and i think that you know they were talking earlier about planning um planning and getting everything down on paper um so that if you know if you if we were still in covid so you don't know if one you know, you're going to come in tomorrow and one member of the team is going to be knocked out. So having everything solid on paper was, was vital and, and would be vital anyway, because we're brand new to making films. We know how to make a stage show. Yeah. And film is something quite different. So, um, you've, you've chosen a, a short clip to show us. Mm -hmm. you? So we just we get a feel so we can, because we, we couldn't do this with Park Bench Place because it hasn't been broadcast yet. I'm not able to show you any of that, but with Touching the Void, because it's yours and you, it's been out, but you can, yeah. you can show us a clip. Do you want to set it up and tell us what we're going to see? And then I think it's just a minute or two, the clip. It's, Get just, a feel a for the piece. it's just a short clip. Um, it's obviously based on the true story of Joe Simpson, who was uh, mountaineering in 
the absolute grande and fell and despite all odds managed to crawl a very long way with a broken leg back to safety um, and this is the moment just before the fall and what you're going to watch now is the broadcast edit there are essentially three versions of the film we had a live mix that went out in real time and there were four of those um, there was then a on-demand edit which was principally the live mix tweaked ever so slightly and put out subsequently and then there was a broadcast edit where all of the raw footage went into an editing suite was pulled apart and then put back together along the framework of the live mix but everything was re-edited regraded remixed and we're going to watch a clip from that version okay so we'll just give you a second to see you, you um Giles is going to play it from his laptop so we just need to give him enough time to set it going Fast but soft snow was piled thick along the ridge line. Huge, all the hanging cornices hung Sorry. right. Can you, is there sound? Sound, but no picture, Giles. Okay. Shall I? Um, do you, I'm going to introduce Rodri, and then if you can, if you have a chance to think, work out what's going on. Then, if you think you can get it to go, then we'll we'll play it. But let's, if that's all right, I'll bring Rodri in and yep. just and. Um, do you want to, Roger, do you want to tell us about your role in the, in, in all of this? Yeah, so um, I'm the person on the, so I was brought in as a mentor really for the um, filming side of it. So my uh, day job is a multi-camera director. So I specialize in uh, directing live shows, theater, um, opera, dance um, for television. So working with theater companies. So for the space, for example, I have done um, sort of quite large scale stuff like um, Shakespeare trilogy. So I was the live director for Philida Lloyd's film of the um, three Shakespeare plays, the trilogy. Um, also, I did um, directed with um, Albion from the Almeida um, with uh, Rupert Gould, but also on a much smaller scale um, in terms of a, a size of a, a, the company, I worked with Breach Theatre on is true is true is true which was um the other two were obviously shot live with an audience edited after but this was done specifically then for camera so we took it away from the stage put it onto location um and then i was brought in then by tom morris and giles to work with um the team um the, the sort of the creative team behind the filming the live filming because obviously there was live elements to this um so um with tom who was directing and um, Simon Baker who was a technical director um, and I just came in just uh, during the tech week just to, to sort of give some advice on um, you know some placements of cameras how to make the most of what they had in terms of possibly changing a few positions of where the cameras would go to make the most of what they needed but also in terms of language you know it's, it's how um, you know so you know, with the um, bench back plays, you can play with a with a shot and try it again and whatever. Obviously, with with a live cut, you have to make some decisions beforehand, and what works and how you get from one thing to another. Um, I think what was incredible, I think about the Bristol Old Vic. Obviously, I had no idea what I was walking into. I'd seen Touching the Void, the same um, <clears throat> uh, version of the West End uh, recording that Charles was talking about. But what I was, you know, was very impressed with, obviously there was an infrastructure there already. I think obviously they had been doing some um, uh, sort of filming beforehand. And I think the knowledge they had of how, as you, as I think Natalie mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of the skills of how to put on a show for a theatre, some of those skills are obviously transferable about how to put a show onto, onto live stream in this instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, smashing. Giles, are you, do you think you'll be able to give it a go? Should we try we'll again? Try, we'll try. One yeah, we love it. We'll be really <clears throat> to see a bit. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Can you see? Can you see that? Okay. Very good. Let's try. Hopefully, you can hear it. From the summit was tricky. It's like shaving foam. 
They tried to move fast, but soft snow was piled thick along the ridge line. Huge, overhanging cornices hung right out over the west face. If they picked the wrong line, they'd step out into a thousand feet of emptiness. So, they traversed, slowly, roped together, and they had to concentrate. For if one of them were to fall, then the other would immediately jump down the other side so as to take each other's weight on either side of the ridge. Fuck! 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 Say! Say! Note to self! Check the descent line next time! Yeah, note to self if there is a next time! But they thought the ridge ran smoothly all the way down to the cold, but it didn't. There was a big notch. Shit! Ice cliff! That's about a 50 foot drop! Have you ever read Walden by Henry David Thoreau? Uh, no. It's really good, Sarah. It's, it's actually been really useful for this book. Look, Richard! I, I can't see a way round! Uh, Joe couldn't abseil down the notch because the snow at the top was too soft. He couldn't take that secure anchor point. So he decided to climb down. But down climbing is harder than climbing up. Yeah. Well, you don't have the same ability to see ahead, and you never know where you're putting your feet. Fuck! Also, the ice was shitty. And they were in a hurry. I'm gonna go! I'm gonna go! I'm gonna go! So he fell. In Walden by Henry David Thoreau, the author says that to find the truth of ourselves, we must test ourselves against nature. That it's only by experiencing the wilderness alone that we discover life in its purest form. We find ourselves reflected in the glorious mirror that is nature. It's really quite profound. Look, Richard, what is happening to Joe? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you for that. I'm just, I'm going to come back to Rodri and think, when you're watching that again, Rodri, what, what's going on in your mind? What are you, what is it making you think about in terms of the decisions that were made and what really made um, impact here? I think, I think what's good here, I mean, I have to say that the live cut was really, really brilliant though, you know, as I say, actually they had four goes at it, which is very different from most television when we film uh, a play or, or or a performance we tend to only do it once or twice maybe and and what's incredible here is obviously you've got um a, a shot shot list of over four performances and actually the, the cameras weren't doing exactly the same every time there was the the biggest difference i would say in the, in the approach of the live between how we would do it on you know at the um on, on television or whatever or live cinema is you have to make a many more decisions beforehand. So, you know, for example, in, on a play like this, I probably, if I would have been directing, had a thousand shots already prepared. So every camera knew exactly what they were doing at exactly, you know, at the same time. And that wouldn't change very much. Here, we, we although there's a shot bank, I think the Giles uh, called it, is other cameras sort of knew where they were going towards, which character they're going towards, or what kind of shot they'd be doing. But there wasn't a sort of a roadmap of exactly how that going. Um, I think what you got here is just the fact that actually, once it gets now to the editing point, you've got uh, Tom, who was um, you know directing, had all these choices, and therefore all this thing makes it very dynamic. Um, you know the uh, you know the quality of the pictures is great. The quality of the sound mix is I think is fantastic, and I think all of those, if I'm right, Giles, I think were done by members of the theatre team to all purposes i think there was one or two maybe uh, one cameraman that came in and i just think that you know so i think it's in remarkable that all the camera work was done by by the technical staff of the theatre and actually just shows you know with the right equipment um and the right um i think there was a lot of much more rehearsal time because the cameras were part of the tech week so when when people went on stage for the tech the cameras were there from the beginning with Simon, the technical director, you know, sort of overseeing all that. Um, and I think that sort of um, involvement they had then 
So, you know, so while, you know, if, if we brought a television team in, there'd be less time. And obviously the skill wise, they, you know, they would find these things very quickly. But I think with the, with the theater team who don't do it every day, they do other things, you know, for them to have the time to explore and to sort of push their limits and to be part of that thing was, was is a really good way of doing it, I think. So was that the purpose of the Tech Week, to give people that chance to explore and try things out? I think Giles can... Well, yeah, two, two purposes. First, to get the show back up and running um, and to, you know, so we can work out... The, the set is fairly complicated and there's quite a lot of flying involved. It's a complicated show. So, so the actors can work out what they're doing but also so that all the cameras can work out what they're doing. You can do, I think we did two, two test streams. So you do the camera rehearsals where you work out what everyone's going to do and how to tell the story and the kind of language, some of which has been thought of in advance and some of which is discovered in the moment. And then two test streams so that you can practice the logistical broadcasting and make sure that the broadcast is going to work and everyone, when they dial in at 7.30, is going to have something to see. Um, and you can then sit, watch the whole show, make your notes, feed them back in, do it again, watch the show, feed them in, so that when you get to the first, first um, digital night, um, you're really solid and happy and with, with what you're going to put out. So we've been asked how many cameras were used. I don't know who, who's in the best, whether that's a Rodri question. Yeah, it was around eight to nine. So I think there was, I, I think that Simon had um, access to seven at a time, most of which were operated. I think five of them were operated. And then there were a few um, in the um, Sula Grande in the ice uh, mountain. There was one or maybe two, actually two um, remote cameras, which were then operated separately and they came in and out as needs be. So for example, when um, Simon falls down, there's a shot from above the mountain that looks down on on him on the ground and all that kind of stuff. There's some quite dramatic shots, um, certainly in the, in the first and second half uh, of from the mountain. Um, but basically, there's um, in terms of where they were, there was um, a wide shot which sees the whole stage. Obviously, there was only uh, there was one at the back of the. It's a relatively small um, <clears throat> theatre. So there's one at the back of the theatre. And then there's around four on either side, right by the sort of right, especially down the by the front of the stage. And then there was a low angle. They, uh, the theatre took out maybe three or four rows for a tracking camera, which allowed then, you know, some really fantastic low angle shots, for example, again, of the mountain. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and can I just ask another practical question that's been asked? I think it's a yes or no. It says, so you had a rehearsal week, it might be a Giles question, you had a rehearsal week and then a technical week with filming and then the theatre run is the question, Giles. So the theatre run and the live streaming happened at the same time. So we had the rehearsal week, which was about a week only because the West End run had finished the previous year and it was the same cast, so everyone knew the show. So we had just over a week to rehearse it. Then we went into the space. We had a tech period, which was taking the show in the film, and then four shows, which were live performances with an audience and live streamed with the digital audience. So it all happened in a space of two and a half weeks. Well, it seems to, so I'm listening to all that and thinking it's come back to this question of planning, isn't it? It's just, there's so much going on at once. That's So much planning, but I, d I think if we'd attempted to do it with a new show, then it would have been, so, so doing it with a show that as a theater, we know all of the creatives know, the cast knew, um, meant that we could put all of this extra things on it in quite a small space of time and and not be overwhelmed. Thank you. Um, Rodri, you, you have talked about how good you thought the live cut was and also how the, you, you said the theatre was really well used in that. Mm. And I wondered what you meant by that and what specific examples would be... I, I'm, I'm thinking again about the principles and you know, what a smaller organisation would take from this? What, what are the things, the secrets really to success of using the theatre well? I think, um, actually, I think in uh, one of the really good decisions I think that uh, the Old Vic made was that, 
it didn't hide the theater. So for example, I would say in, in the first scene, which is all based in the um, in, in a dream wake of, um, of Simon. So it's a funeral and it's the, uh, the, they're all in the pub, all the climbers and the sisters in the pub. And, um, you know, I think that one of Tom's big things was actually the audience is also part of this scene. The audience aren't, you know, they're, they're also in the wake. So that um, Sarah Joe sister actually um, speaks directly to the audience. And while probably on television, we would have, if we were doing that in national theater, he probably wouldn't have taken a shot of the audience listening to that. He wouldn't, there's no way. However, I think there was a sort of creative decision by Tom to say, actually, they are part of this way. They are part of the scene. And therefore there were shots of the audience um, you know, during this thing. So we're going off from the stage, actually seeing there is an audience listening to it. And I think the way I think that the reason why it worked, um, I think, is because the way they set up <clears throat> at the beginning of the four streams, Tom went out and spoke to the audience. And obviously this was quite in, in May, or I think it was in May. So it was really when audience was only just coming back. And I think that the way he just involved them, they were this part of this production, not only the audience in the theatre, but also the audience watching in in Cardiff or in, um, you know, in Australia, or whatever. And I think that that sort of made it quite, uh, and I think then having the shots of the audience in some of the scenes actually just sort of brought everybody together. I thought both on digitally and in, in the performance. And then the, um, the next um, live stream, um, the Old Vic did, which was uh, Withering Heights a few weeks ago, they kept that sort of idea of involving the audience at the beginning and what they did here they actually the presentation by the director um, was actually done from the audience so again I think it was thinking and the thinking about the way the audience are part of this as opposed to a separate entity altogether. Thank you very much I'm going to ask Natalie to come back in and see whether she's got any questions for you but just um, the other thing that we wanted to just ask somebody's asked about and it's just your comment on on sound and how you've used sound in this show and uh, Again, I, I don't know whether that's a, uh, whether Giles, you've got some thoughts about how important sound was and how you got that, those different, the different quality of sound in there. Yeah, when you said earlier, what would be the big takeaways if you were doing it, whatever the scale or budget. And I think the big thing is when you think about filming, you think about cameras, obviously, and not to forget about sound. I think a lot of people probably watched I mean, hopefully some people watch Touching the Void on a big widescreen television in the sitting room, but some people I imagine watched it on quite a low resolution device, but with some really good headphones. And actually don't sound, it's very important to Touching the Void specifically, but I think it's important regardless and not to just think about cameras and cuts and, and forget about that. Um, I mean, on a pr practical point of view, you've obviously got someone who's mixing it for the audience in the room and then you've got someone else who's mixing the audio for the audience watching digitally and then all of the audio tracks are recorded as individual stems so that when you go into the edit you've got the freedom to remix the whole the whole piece um and certainly in the um in the the broadcast edit the sound is more intense they've been able to dial things up um and it feels very um Visual. There was a kind of going, leading on from what Roger was just saying about the involvement of the audience. Tom had this idea for a language of a, of the show, which was there's a language in the pub, and and broadly the pub is downstage and the mountain is upstage, and there's this language for the pub which is quite uh, real and it's rooted in reality, and there's another language for the mountain, the style of filming, I think, was different. The shots were uh, different and the sound is different. It was like these two worlds, one of which which is close to home and one of which which is almost, I mean, it's so unbelievable. Um, it's, it's almost like fantasy. Um, and being able to, to play with that and make things more stylized and dial things up fed into these two worlds that at some points sit 
on top of each other when you're seeing the show sometimes it's like one more tier one more tier and sometimes in the wide shots you got that and sometimes you got them very differently you know which is why i suppose in the pub you saw shots of the audience and you saw the proscenium and you were aware of the auditorium whereas broadly when you were in the mountain it was a visual in a big black box that just fed off and everything was more intense and the sound was more intense okay thank you um, Natalie, what, did, did you have a question that you were thinking about? Yeah, there's so many questions I could ask, but I'm particularly interested. It sounds like the Bristol big team, you know, it's amazing to think that they, the technical team, that most of those roles were filled by members of the theatre's own team. And I just wondered how you scoped out, perhaps did some training, how you sort of scoped out who those people would be. Was it people that had an interest in filming or photography or sound or whatever role they took on and how you kind of supported them into those into those roles for the for the capture. I suppose it was important for us not to just outsource everything because I ideally this is something that is now part of the of the business and there are certain roles within the film production team that starts on top of the stage production team that logically the, the the shot caller logically that is a stage manager if you can do a stage manager you can, you can do that um most of the camera operators are like lighting or sound um operators retrained and i said to the production manager, I said, you know how long does that take and and pretty much no time at all you bring them in you say this is how it works and as long as he said you have one really good camera operator actually with the the resource run that you put in place around it that um works i think the big area of investment is the vision mixer which is the person that's going between all of the shots and choosing what you see working with obviously the director of film, working with the shot that's probably um we've used the same vision mixer for all of the work that we've done and, and all of the work wise children have done it's all been that um, same person Simon Baker so that's probably the area where if we were going to invest we would um, want to do that because that's like really specialized thank you should we should we ask Rodri if he's got any thoughts about that about the sort of skilling up and his role in it and then we might we'll bring the others back in as well because we're kind of getting to the end and we sort of open the conversation up yeah, so I'll, I'll come back to the um, vision mixer Simon thing in a second, but I think one of the key things here, I think, is is the use of cameras that uh, was in the Bristol Olympic, how this is possible uh, for, you know, people who haven't had that much experience on it. So this, so basically the Old Vic has got two cameras, essentially, what they're, they're using. One is the sort of, um, I think Sony FSMs, I think is that is sort of, um, you know, the kind of camera they probably would have been using on park bench so it's quite small um so obviously they didn't change the lens but actually it's you know a relatively small bit of kit to be working and then um and again you know it's not cheap but it's not you know a, a camera you'd be using on uh, on live television so you know um and and it's now also the sort of cameras they use on um on the globe live on the nt live or nt at home sorry i should say not nt live they, so you know so it's a good quality camera and they also had some ptz cameras which are sort of i will say the size of a sort of arctic roll if you can if you're old enough to remember uh, those and they're sort of remote cameras and the good thing about them is that they can go anywhere and they take very little space and so those are the cameras that were actually in uh, above or inside the the mountain on the stage and you would never have seen any of them and they and so they can be controlled they were controlled in the same place as where the live cut is going from. So you could only have quite a big range of shots of that. And they're, 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 that's, those are cameras which are, for example, in the Southback Centre, they got some in the Barbican. So there's many theatres that um, have them and they're relatively simple to use. Um, in terms of training, I think, I think one of the um, things that the first question I asked when I when I went to the uh, old Vic and met Tom and the team was who's directing the live TV bit and even and Tom went uh, uh not sure and actually I think is one so obviously Tom was very much as the creative director very much in charge of what was going on 
However, as, as Giles said, <coughs> Simon, who was vision mixing, so it, in terms for people who don't know vision mixing, so, you know, as we said, there were seven cameras. And so uh, the vision mixer presses camera one or camera four or camera five at the moment, and that's what cuts, changes the shot. And as I say, that's quite a skilled, um, incredibly skilled um, craft. Um, and, and in a way, a lot of the decisions have to be made live by that person, especially in a position like this where there wasn't a specific script to be working from. So Simon was making the decision about when to cut to the shot of, you know, the man falling off the rock or pressing the button on the jukebox. It, that they had to be his decisions because he was a person in charge. And I think in a way, a lot of my training when I went in was just, <clears throat> just to sort of give confidence to really about what works in terms of what shots work best next to each other. So for example, you know, is to have, um, you know, if you have three characters on stage, it's good that all the cameras go one character each and it's lovely to go from one character to another as opposed to all us have to go to a wide shot to get to the next shot. Um, also having the confidence, I think when, and I think we saw it in that scene there, there actually, is you don't have to have the person who's talking the person on shot. So sometimes the reaction is as impressive or as interesting as a person talking, especially some of this dialogue is incredibly quick. So I think you can wait, you can stay with a character. Um, and actually, it's, and then it's probably just making sure for the vision mixer, but also I think for Tom, you know, that actually at all times, you've got to make sure the camera, you've got to work the cameras to sort of communicate because they're not, in television, that whoever's got the shot that's been pressed by the vision mixer, which is a live shot, all the other cameras will see what that shot is because they've got um, a thing in the cameras that, that means they can have a look at that. Therefore, they'll react to that. In the old vet, they don't have that technique, I don't think. Um, and therefore, it's the job of the vision mixer and the director to make sure that the other cameras have got something different. Otherwise you'll end up with five shots of Natalie Woolman, where we need a shot of Linda and Giles and Rodri to make the cut work. Thank you. I'm going to um, ask Dan and Leanne to join us again now. And I'm wondering specifically, because I think Dan, your, Dan's role is very like Rodri's, both in background and your, and your work on, in different contexts. What, I'm just wondering, Dan, if you're hearing anything, what Rodri's saying, how, how that echoes with your experience or any other advice you'd be giving to people, things to watch for. Yeah, it sounds like you've got way more of a headache than, than I have. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Any, anything to do with multi-camera self is, is just in a world of its own. So it requires all the planning that we have to do traditionally with one or two cameras. Um, but just on a much bigger scale. Um, but again, that whole kind of planning, that whole kind of um, having to really know what you're going for as an end product before you even switch one camera on is, is pretty much the same principle um, and just, you know, massively important. But yeah, it's, it's, it, there's a reason why I stay away from multicam setups usually. Yeah. So we're really thinking about, we've got two really different examples here, haven't we? That you know, there's some similarities and some differences. Natalie, did you have a question to the panel as a whole? Well, I've got a, a, a maybe a follow-up question, maybe on what we've just touched on, which is based on what somebody asked in the chat, which is about, obviously we've just heard about the amazingly flexible um, Bristol Old Vic technical team taking on these roles. Somebody in the chat asked about um, winning over the hearts and minds of the, of the technical team. And I just wondered for Giles, what, you know, Bristol or Vic at Home has obviously become this really amazing um, audience resource and an amazing audience offer. And I just wondered how yourself and Tom had worked to sort of carry this, your staff with you on this kind of new venture, especially as you're, you know, as, as new as the in-person experience has come back, if you had sort of any advice um, about winning over hearts and minds. Um, yeah, that. it's a good question. Really, I'd say that winning over the hearts and minds of the technical team was probably the easiest department to win over because they're genuinely really excited. Coming off of the back of the last year, a lot of technical staff have had to retrain a lot or have moved over to film and, and television because there wasn't any work in theatre. And actually, unless you can 
guarantee them a, a sufficient amount of work it's 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 not worth them making the transition it's just too high risk um so those that came with us i think they were really excited about you know operating a camera instead of a follows but you know all, and being part of um this and, and just excited you know doing this in may to be doing the show again after all this time i think we but it is it winning over the hearts and minds of of, of the um other stuff it is very different people working theatre they know how to do a play and they can do it and they think we know how to do this and they know why they're doing it um and you're seeing the result of your work if you stand in an auditorium and you look at the audience you can see what you've done and and doing something cinematic where your audience is watching online is completely different um and i suppose that is um it is key it's not just taking the audience with you it is taking the staff with you um and we're still fairly new to it and i suppose it's just giving the staff the opportunity to ask the questions as to why are we doing this why are we you know it's a, it's a lot of work and there's a lot of things that we don't know how to do and we're having to in the moment firefight and, and work out how we approach all of these things and it's just explaining why you're doing it what the benefits are and i think the benefits are huge um um but but taking the technical team along i think that was easy i think they really enjoyed it Great. Thank you. Um, Leanne, do you, if you, you know, reflecting on the process, do you, in terms of sort of the skills and getting people in, involved, how was, how was your experience of working on um, park bench plays? Um, I think because we were outside, we didn't really need a lot of involvement from, from the technical teams. Um, but I think, I think, I mean, in other projects I've worked in, I think, um, yes, as a film team, you can feel like sometimes you're coming in into somebody else's territory and that is their skill set, it's their forte. And I think for, for, from, from a non-theatre person going into that environment, I think when it's worked really, really well is when the theatre technical teams have felt a real sense of ownership of the project as well and not that they're just there to help out and sort of change things for the film and I think by the sounds of it Giles has really got his team like really drawn them in to um, invest in the project and have that ownership and and in the nicest possible way I love talking with technical people when they start getting really geeky about cables and and things like that and because it's such a they've got such knowledge and I think you know, by, by approaching them and asking their opinion and how can we solve this problem? Like Danny said, all solving problems for technical people to show you their knowledge and, and expertise. I think it's, it is a very collaborative process and a, and a kind of, um, yeah. And, and I think lots of people do get excited. I mean, if theatre people that we worked with, even though that we didn't have technical involvement, they were still really super excited about it because it's something they hadn't experienced before. So I think making sure it's like an, a really strong collaborative process because, you know, we learned terminology from the theatre people, you know, we taught them terminology. So I think it's just, yeah, that ownership and collaboration and, 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 and whatnot. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, we've got one question. To, so I'm going to ask this of um, Dan and Rodri, one or other of you might like to answer it, but, but <laughs> it's like a, um, if you had one technician and one day to make a multi-camera live stream, how would you go about it? And then afterwards it says that's our reality. What would, would you have a word of advice for that person or a, or a suggestion for them? Either, I don't know, I'm looking at, Rodri, Rodri's speaking first, I think. Okay. Well, as the, the word, obviously multi-camera means more than one camera, which is not to say, of course, that you couldn't use more than cam one camera by yourself. So I would say you could easily have, you know, two cameras, you know, one locked off, one being used, maybe a second locked off at a different angle. So I think there are, there are ways of doing it. Obviously you just got to, <clears throat> you know, you could change if it's not live, then you could obviously do several, um, even with a multi-camera, obviously you could do several uh, passes on the same thing, changing what camera you're uh, operating on one single time. Lovely. And Dan, would you have a would you have a suggestion? Um, I think yeah. I think if it's not live, 
then yeah, it would just be a case of just being creative in the sense of just locking off the camera and getting as many passes as possible and just accepting the fact of, you know, sometimes you just have to work within the limitations of what we've got um, and, and really make that one camera <laughs> re really put its work in. But yeah, again, if it's not live, then it would just be a simple case of, you know, just trying to make sure we can do, you know, several passes um, from different angles and just make it have that same multi-camera feel. Okay, thank you very much. Natalie, did you have any more questions for the panel? Got another one from the audience as well. If you, if... Why don't you go, let, do the audience okay. first and then I can always jump in. The, the audience the audience question was, and I think it sort of follows on from all of this, just how much effort all of this is. And just talking about the, the stress of, you know, you're, you're already doing a production and then you're making a film as well. How do you manage people's well-being in that situation was the question. How do we... And he makes sure you get the, the best out of people and, and they have a happy time of it. And Giles is smiling, so I think that'll be a Giles question. Uh, I don't really know how to answer that. I suppose I'd just say that we all acknowledge that this was the first time we were doing this and that it is going to get easier because if, um, you know, if something goes wrong with a play, in the, in the making of a play, we, we probably know how to resolve that because we've got people with 20 years of experience in making plays, in, in many cases more. Um, this is the first time that we made the film, so I think we just all acknowledge that it was a learning experience. Everything, not just making up a, a live stream, marketing a live stream, talking about a live stream, trying to connect with an audience that's not in Bristol, is across the world. Everything was new, and even now, we acknowledge that it is an experiment. We're going to try things. Some of them are going to work. Some of them aren't going to work. Hopefully the mistakes we make, we won't repeat. Hopefully as we move forward, we'll improve. Um, so I think if you acknowledge that, it lifts some of the pressure. Um, but, but of course it's all, you know, any anytime something is live, there is a certain amount of stress that's just, you know, that's inevitable. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Natalie, did you have another question for? Okay. Oh, Leanne wants to go on, Leanne. Yeah, and I think, sorry, just jumping on the back of that as well, from, a, from, from my point of view, I know that we were an ex, I was external to the theatre, but I think as with anything, that's where your planning is really, really important and, and um, roles and responsibilities. So if everybody knows the part they're playing in the production, it's like anything, like with, if, it's, if it's a theatre production or a TV production, if everybody knows their roles and responsibilities and what's expected of them, then, and it's planned, and then that makes a whole heap of difference. And communication, you have to make sure that each element is communicating with, with, with the other elements. Like we had weekly Zoom conversations. So we had myself and Danny as the, like the filming crew would have weekly Zooms with the uh, theatre team. So everybody knew what was going on and what stage it was at and what needed to be done to get it to the next place. And I realised that's a luxury um, because we did have that time. But I think as soon as things start getting rushed and there's not planning and communication, that's when people can get stressed. And that's something that we put in place for every production we do, regardless of what it is, people's mental health and stress levels. Because if people get stressed, they can make mistakes and it's not it's just not conducive to a kind of harmonious production. So communication, roles and responsibilities and clearness about that, I think. Okay, so we've just got um, a few minutes left before we finish up. And I wanted to sort of bring it back to something that Natalie said at the very beginning, which was about um, stealing, <laughs> stealing ideas. And, you know, if you're thinking about capturing your performance for the screen, how do you get inspiration? Where do you learn? what you might like, what might work for you. And I wondered whether, this is a bit sort of, you know, off the top of your heads, but is there, where, where do you go for ideas? Is there a particular performance or a film or a, a sort of way of working that, that really inspires you and that has informed how you've worked in theatre? So I'm just leaving that out there. Does anybody have any particular example that they've, something they've loved or a way of working that they've taken inspiration from? Rodri, if you got, is there something you're smiling away? Yeah, no, I'm only smiling. Yeah, um, yeah. I think I, the first time I did um, a comedy um, stage play, um, it was actually an opera. I think what I did was just 
you know, I'm, I'm not one for look, looking too much detail and sort of, you know, analysing how other people might do a live comedy. So I went and just watched Frasier and Seinfeld and stuff like that, which was partly obviously done with a multi-camera because that's how they do it up there. But it's just then in terms of, so it's just learning things like, you know, um, the timing in terms of reactions, in terms of movement, in terms of how we can use the camera and reactions as opposed to tell the story in a different way than, you know, I hadn't done much comedy. So I think I learned quite a bit just in seeing how people like that would do it. Thank you. Is anybody else? Oh, Natalie, go on. Well, I was just going to say, I think it's about being tr sampling lots of different stuff, short form, single camera, multi camera, sitcoms, Rodri's just mentioned, but even just the chat today, what people have said, you know, somebody's just posted that they, one technician, one day, multiple cameras, and they put a link. Well, I'd like to see that. There's somebody else who's put that they, did a comedy on Zoom, but they wanted to focus on um, making it feel more filmic than a Zoom. You know, I think it's about, I feel like even today, there's a whole list of links that I quite want to go through because people, as I said at the beginning, it is an emerging art form and people are using loads of different technical tools, loads of different approaches to doing it. And it's about sampling different things. And one of the things I was struck by watching Touching the Void is the moment that Tom Morris comes out in the on-demand um, piece and sort of welcomes the audience in the theatre and welcomes the audience online and asks the audience in the theatre to applaud so and the people at home kind of know that they've got their kind of, I don't know, avatars in the theatre. It's a really beautiful moment of connection between the two audiences before the plays even started and when I saw that I thought god that's really that's so smart and so welcoming um and it just sort of all goes in the bank to when you see these things that work really well so I think it's about being quite um broad in your in your taste and what you what you try because sometimes it's a technical solution sometimes it's an audience engagement solution like that or br beautiful or br Bristol or Vic moment, and sometimes it's it's how how something's been configured. Okay, so unless anybody has a kind of ten second answer to that question, there's anything else you want to share, or you could stick it into chat, which I think people are already doing. That brings us to um, the end of the webinar today. So I wanted to say thank you very much to all our contributors for generously sharing their experience and their ideas with all of you and with, um, with the audience for engaging so much and asking questions and, and being a, a fantastic audience. So thank you. Oh, and just before we finish, there is an evaluation form. Um, it's very quick and you'll, you'll get it as you leave the webinar, but we really appreciate if you could take a minute or two to fill it in. It really helps us to understand what we can do differently, what we can do better. And of course, that we're needing that evaluation to support the, the programme and being able to bring you the webinars. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, goodbye and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>